I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The 137th Psalm, and particularly its last verse, is often left out of lectionaries and psalters, or ignored in musical adaptations, and it's not hard to see why. But after all, it is in our scriptures. If you read through the Bible, or take up a monastic practice of praying the Psalms regularly, you'll come across it. And at least at the beginning of this week, I thought it would be a good idea to stop ignoring the troubling reading and take an honest look at this disturbing song. Now, by last night, I was wondering if that was really a good idea, particularly in selecting it out of the two optional responses for our public liturgy. But here we are, and we might as well continue on to see if we can understand and maybe even learn something without even thinking about justifying or normalizing this language or sentiment. Now, many Christian scholars have weighed in on the message in this psalm with decidedly mixed results. Quoting one Catholic professor of Old Testament, we could consider recommending that Christians at prayer must keep in mind that praying the psalms puts them within a pre-Christian and sub-Christian ethos on a level far surpassed by the Sermon on the Mount. Not to be outdone, a Protestant asserts that it is the Jewish mechanical conception of the working of God's righteousness which erected a barrier strong enough to prevent the psalmist from pressing on towards love as revealed in the New Testament. Now, that's just plain anti-Jewish theology wrapped up in pious language, and we can't get out of our momentary discomfort by simply denigrating those who have constantly been Christian scapegoats to our everlasting shame. So we can't go there. A couple of evangelical commentators, one ironically named Dr. Love, have urged us to consider that the psalmist, in desiring gruesome carnage of innocence, is not expressing human emotion, but rather divine, and therefore just, wrath at evil, and so it's okay. I don't know about you, but I think that's even more disturbing. Others try to say that the true target of the curses is abstract sin, or even a prayer for the destruction of the devil, which also seems like an easy way out if only they didn't completely ignore the actual language and narrative of the psalm. Even Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German liberal theologian, well acquainted with evil and suffering and eventually killed by the Nazis alongside Jewish prisoners, once tried to argue that A, All prayers are Jesus' prayers. So, B, Jesus could pray this psalm in good conscience because he alone had an innocent heart. Sorry, I love you, Dietrich, but I'm not buying that one, and I doubt you did either by the end. So, in an effort to take this psalm more seriously, we really need to know more about where it came from. This psalm and its author are clearly situated in 586 BCE, or thereabouts, at the time of the Babylonian exile. This tragedy was possibly the most significant event in Judaism, responsible for the initial transformation of the religion from a land-based insular cult to a scripture-based universalist hope. Here's a brief timeline to set the context straight. So first... The people of Israel emerge in about the mid-2nd millennium BCE and are formed into a kingdom by Saul and David around the mark of the 1000 BCE, only to splinter after King Solomon into northern Israel and southern Judah around 950. 200 years later, the northerners are conquered and absorbed into the Assyrian Empire, And then before another two centuries pass, we arrive at the context of this passage as the south is overrun by the Babylonians. But even before this, ancient lore speaks of the inhabitants of Edom as a related people, descended from the Israelite patriarch Jacob's brother Esau. The relationship between these tribes has long been troubled, 
with fighting back and forth for centuries. Around two centuries before the Great Exile, a Judean king boasted of driving the Edomites back into their southern hills by slaughtering 10,000 of them, and then taking another 10,000 captives to the heights and casting them down upon the rocks. Needless to say, there is no love lost between the two groups. And this is borne out in another cycle of vengeance when the great and cruel Babylonian Empire is aided and cheered on in their conquest of Judah by their neighbors in Edom. Now, unlike the earlier Assyrian conquest of northern Israel, where all the conquered peoples were killed or deported, these Babylonians have a different approach to ruling their colonies, and they take only the elite back to Babylon with them, taking the musicians, the priests, and the political leaders, and leaving the peasants in place under remote control. But there must have been at least one significant overlap, because over and over, even within our scriptures, we see evidence for how horrific ancient warfare was. War was not merely the taking of territory or the killing of soldiers. It involved the strategic and systematic abuse of innocence, the raping of women and the slaughter of infants. Now I say ancient because that's how it seems to us today in the little white middle-class American bubble that most of us share. We've been so successfully shielded from global reality by our own modern day empire that we don't realize how regularly these things still happen. It is easy for scholars ensconced in colonialist power centers to be outraged at the extreme responses of those who suffer, like in our psalm today. But I can't help but imagine how different it must be for others. When rereading those first verses again this week, I immediately thought of the African nations that Europeans and Americans slaughtered, raped, and enslaved for centuries. How those exiled to a foreign land wept at the stripping away of religion, culture, music, and everything they held dear, and how they might also have refused to sing to entertain their captors when asked. I can imagine just a little bit about how their descendants might still feel to be praised for sharing their gifts of athletic prowess and musical genius, but cursed as soon as they dare mention the injustice they still experience or the reparations long overdue. With this perspective in mind, maybe we can see this poet, this musician of upper-class Judah, exiled to Babylon in a more sympathetic light. Everything they have and known themselves to be has been ripped away. They have personally seen the slaughter of innocents. This psalm holds nothing back from the human expression. Who wouldn't want reciprocal vengeance against their captors? Who can blame the poet for wishing the young innocents of the Edomites to be broken against the high mountain walls of the citadel they call the rock, just as those rock dwellers cheered on the slaughter of Judean infants, even as we all privately know that the carrying out of this curse would solve nothing. But without discounting this sociological reading in the slightest, I would like to suggest one other angle to reading this psalm that might be beneficial to each of us in our individual and inward journeys. The great Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann has suggested that there are three categories of the psalms which correspond roughly to what the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur described as a universal human cycle. These three are the psalms of orientation, of stability and status quo, the psalms of disorientation, when something intervenes to break up what seemed so comfortable and safe, and then the songs of reorientation, a return to a new status quo that is not the same as the old, but is also not still stuck in the middle of the trauma. By this measure, Psalm 137 may be the epitome of the disorientation psalms. This poet is in the middle. He's grappling with the loss of identity 
meaning assurance, solidity, and certainty. They were recently convinced of their unassailable place in the apple of God's eye, guaranteed of blessing and success. But then in a moment, everything changed. They have nothing left but tears, sorrow, and ineffectual curses against their enemies. While most of us have not, and hopefully never will, experience physical destruction and exile the way this psalmist did, many can or one day will be able to relate to this feeling of the moorings being ripped out from under us. Maybe it's the loss of a career, of a loved one, or of health. Whatever it is, there's only one way forward, and it is through. Through the pain, the emptiness, and the heartache. Nothing will ever be the same again. That is true, but it is also true that on the other side may lie a new life. This new life is different. It might be a lot grayer, where the certain blacks and whites are muddled together, and where we may have more patience to suspend judgment and hear a different perspective. Those who study trauma tell us that this experience of the loss of control over circumstances cannot be healthily resolved without plumbing its depths. Those in the midst of trauma, like the poet of our psalm, are in a space that could never have been anticipated by their past and for which a future is currently unimaginable. Rather than trying to push them backward or forward, what is needed is an audience who listens and affirms their story's legitimacy and their continued existence and new place in the world. Dr. Charles Ricks, a classically trained pianist, musician, and a professor of Hebrew Bible, writes that this psalm gives us an excellent example of this process. He writes, Here we are called not to digest the poet's last outburst, or to finally explain it, understand it, or jump quickly to a cheap forgiveness, but to listen and to bear witness to his suffering. The silent harps make audible the suffering of those around us and ask us to bear witness to the importance of their story, the reality that their lives matter and that much of their story remains unspoken. May we all hold room for each other undergoing trauma of any kind to express the depths of our stories, whether those are society-wide or narrowly individual, and to trust each other enough to release those darkest thoughts, because it is only once we face the bottom that we can begin to rise again together. Amen.